This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I was joined by a great guy, Arjun Sofat who is the CEO and founder of Free Soul, and they do whey protein, or not just whey, but protein for the female market. And it's great to hear how he started his business, uh, why he always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and all of the challenges he's faced since starting. So raising cash, marketing, using the various social media platforms, finding some co-founders as well. So really, really cool, and I hope you enjoy the story. Hey, it's Lewis, welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, we're live. Arjun, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure, pleasure. We've just been chatting over coffee and we've realised that we've probably spent most of our life around about the same places. We have. Radler, Haberdashers, Watford. The exciting ends. Yeah. 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 So you went to school in Habs? I did. Went to Habs. I was there from 13 to 18. Very intense, but played a lot of sport. Nice. Cricket in particular, which is how I know your friend Stuart. Yeah, and you're still yeah. playing. Oh, I, cool. I, I like to say that I'm still playing, although I'm much lower standard, <laughs> which is part of the aging process, I guess. But never... <laughs> you need to keep up that fitness. I think so, yeah, yeah. I've tried to keep it up. Oh, how so? So I do, um, I diarise my fitness, because you've got to be really structured nowadays, because you just get so busy with work. Yeah, yeah. And most of my friends, and if they're listening, I don't care, <laughs> look completely, uh, completely out of shape. Right. So I do CrossFit. Okay, yeah, of Which course. is like this American, yeah, like yeah. weightlifting, yeah. calisthenics and stuff. Full body, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I do that like, say, three times a week. Okay. I do yoga once a week. Very nice. Good for mobility. Amazing Essentials. for mobility. Yeah. And uh, you can have a little meditation in there and of stuff. Course. Yeah. And then I do uh, running, so okay. marathons and half marathons. Wow, so, so I, at a high standard. Then, yeah, well, yeah. I didn't say I was good at it. I tried. I tried. So I book in like a, a marathon or half marathon, okay. like maybe a couple a year. Okay. And it gives me a goal of course, to yeah. train for. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is why I'm looking this good. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and I have a bit of protein as well. Brilliant. I hope you're yeah. choosing wisely on that protein. Well, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what, about, what, so what about you? What Training you? wise? Yeah. So for me, obviously, there are physical benefits. You get in better shape. But I, I mainly do it because it sets my day up nicely. So I'm up at 5.30 pretty much every day. I'm in the gym by 6.00 done by seven in the office by eight perfect um and it just sets the day up really nicely so yeah. i tend to do weights about four times a week force myself to do cardio once a week and then something sport related once a week so, so like cricket or cricket tennis badminton but the sports stuff will tend to be on the weekend i think it just breaks up your day nicely yeah yeah, yeah. that's um, great yeah and what about for your mind do you yeah, find no, it's like really good for that, mindset and- to be honest that's pretty much why i do it it's a great discipline and it gets you in a routine so the better i work in the gym the better i work in the office and that's sort of my motivation yeah plus it allows you to sort of eat a little bit more flexibly yeah which which is a perk so so you're quite strict with your diet or pretty strict yeah pretty strict i'm transitioning into a a vegan diet right now and so just being able to make that transition i think requires you to be on your nutrition so you're just conscious of what you're eating because i just feel that if you're in the gym you're working hard you want to be kind of doing justice to that through what you eat and um so yeah i'm I'm pretty and why are you transitioning to a vegan diet? I'm assuming it's from eating meat, right? So. Yeah, exactly. So it went from eating meat to becoming vegetarian and now cutting out dairy. And the reason really is it, it's a mixture of a, th- a few things. One is obviously animal welfare. There's been so much more information about kind of what happens in that whole farming process, but also for the environment. So a vegan diet, there's a lot of research behind it that suggests it's kinder to, to the environment. And so it's a whole sort of plethora of different reasons. I, I also feel better when I cut out meat and, and dairy. And so for those reasons, I'm, I'm transitioning. So you feel better when you're not eating meat? Oh, for sure. You just feel lighter. And a lot of people will say kind of, where do you get your protein from? Well, yeah. luckily, that's <laughs> not an issue for me yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's interesting there's some really interesting companies now that make meat in the lab exactly yeah um, I, in fact one came on the podcast um, they're called Higher Steak so they make meat exactly yeah, so you yeah. take a little bit of blood from a cow or pig sure. or whatever sure, sure. grow it in the lab sure. 99% less water etc really yeah you can oh, make fish as well 
Really? So o- overall, going forward, yeah. it feels like that's the way that we're going to be eating. Absolutely. I th- Would you eat that? You'd eat that meat, right? Nothing's been killed. I mean, given that nothing's been killed, I, I haven't done any sort of research yeah, on yeah, the yeah, process, yeah. but yeah, provided yeah. there's no sort of animal downside, then I mean, I'd be open to looking into it for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's great. Because also the problem is, I mean, really, the problem is there's so many humans in the planet. Yeah. Because farmland for animals, but also farmland for vegetables. Absolutely. Yeah. So if we're all, let's say we're all vegan eating plant-based stuff, it's yes. still bad for the environment. So it would be nice to get to a point where we're making this stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Which would be awesome. Oh, it would be brilliant. A lot happening in the background to kind of figure out that whole puzzle and yeah, yeah, yeah. think it'll all come to the surface fairly soon, hopefully. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Really interesting. And and your product is all vegan. Well, we have a vegan line and a dairy sure, let's get, let's sure, get into yeah. it. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after uni, so yes. you went into banking. I did. Took the took the investment banking route. I, right. was, um, I was in the M&A team, so the hours were very, very long. But it was fun. I, yeah. I mean, the learning curve is steep, but what you take away from that is a lot of knowledge, a lot of discipline, good work ethic. So I don't, don't regret it whatsoever. It was a fantastic... Yeah couple of years but during that time my dad actually had a very serious health scare and that prompted my mom to take exercise as a stress outlet and and along with that exercise came the take you know taking seriously of nutrition and she started taking these protein shakes to go with the exercise that was supposedly for women but I would look into these shakes and and there wasn't really in anything in the ingredients that made it just justifiably for the female market and alongside that they had these brands which were very demeaning and just talked about weight loss or skipping meals and it was a fairly unhealthy message that they were pushing and I felt that was wrong for on both fronts and so that's the stage I quit my job and started working with a guy called Dr. Adam Gunliff and he's the nutritionist behind all of the innovation in free soul so we developed these blends over the course of a year that actually impacted female well-being through hormonal balance bone density energy uh, collagen production and also impacts the menstrual cycle because it's very high in iron amazing and amazing. alongside that we developed a brand that was genuinely empowering in the same way that if you look at nike you walk into nike's nike town you feel like an athlete and i think that's such a fantastic thing and so we developed a brand that made you feel good about yourself which is sort of where the name free soul comes about and so that's the kind of mini story linking to banking love it love it and so had you always wanted to be an entrepreneur oh for as long as i can remember really and <laughs> banking was um, an education piece I sort of looked at it as yeah, a yeah. post uni kind of military training thing <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah as for as long as Whip I can you remember into shape, get you oh in exactly <laughs> yeah 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 so, so had you done anything before that or you just been business wise yeah so on both my mum's side of the family and my dad's side of the family everyone is into business all oh, okay. my uncles my aunts my grandmother still runs her own business oh, wow. my wow. grandfather's still running his own business and so it's what I've grown up seeing yeah and yeah. so just naturally it's what excites me and gets me up in the morning and even during my time in banking I'd look at these companies as businesses not just clients of a bank and try yeah. and understand sort of how the big machine works yeah. and that's what I find exciting so was it quite a big step for you to quit your banking job or did you always see it as well, I'll do it until I can think of a cool idea to yeah I think before quitting I, I naturally did some commercial analysis looking at the market size the opportunity um, capital that would be required you know, returns, valuations, all that sort of thing. And after assessing all of those things, that's when I made the leap to quit. Yeah. So it was both, you you have to think with your heart, but also the mind has to come into the equation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what's it been like? It's been, it's been great. I mean, um, enjoying every day, you go to work with a purpose. It's exciting because you're on the front line and, you know, pushing the growth forward. And so it's very, very exciting. Obviously more stressful in a different way because yeah, you're yeah. looking after more parts naturally until you've grown out your team. So you started on your own? Yeah. Uh, initially, I was just on my own. Yeah. And and so I was head of finance, head of marketing, head of ops, CEO, Cleaner. head of the cleaning department, <laughs> all, all of it, yeah. And where did you get the product made? So it's all made in the UK. So uh, like I said, Adam, the nutritionist, yeah. I worked with him to formulate the products, but then we found manufacturers in the UK that could meet our specific requirements and manufacture at high quality nice how yeah. come you decided to, to make everything in the UK I just think the quality that you can produce has much higher the regulations are more strict which means that you're sourcing higher quality ingredients yeah. and so you can just control that supply chain and make sure your standards are where they need to be if it's on home turf great is it, it's whey protein whey and uh, pea and white hemp so we have a ah. vegan line and okay. we have a dairy line so ah. the whey is produced here as well as the vegan lines what's white hemp white hemp is a form of hemp protein so it's got a really strong amino acid profile which is why we add it in with a pea protein so the, most of the others not white hemp so 
So what do you get, like white hemp and... And, and regular hemp. And just yeah. regular hemp. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The difference is really the amino, amino acid profile. Ah, okay, fine. Yeah. And do you get, are you doing much CBD stuff? It's an interesting area. Yeah, yeah. And I think the issue right now is that it, it's classified as a novel food. And so the regulation isn't too clear. A novel clear. food. Something along those right. lines. The MHRA is kind of a bit grey on CBD. Okay. And so it's not clear what's going to happen in the short, medium or long term regarding regulations. And so it's definitely an, an interesting product. The research is interesting. But I just think for us to release something CBD related would be a bit premature given the regulations. Everyone seems to be on this bandwagon. Exactly. Like which is a poo, yeah, chocolate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, which is which is interesting. Let's see where yeah, it all yeah. develops. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. it will it will ultimately uh, become more and more popular, I think. Yeah, I think so. It's it's already becoming so mainstream. Yeah. You walk into yeah. Holland and Barrett, they have a whole aisle dedicated yeah. to CBD. I mean, I use a little bit before sleep. Okay. Um, I use the oil, just like a few drops mm-hmm. before bed. Um, it's quite sure, good yeah. also after the gym. Is it so really? Like, yeah, it's an anti-inflammatory, pain relief. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It helps you sleep a little bit. Uh, I mean, who we? Re- I don't know. Who knows, right? Um, but yeah. I guess it's like taking taking vitamins. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I thought it was classified as a health food, but obviously not really. Yeah, I guess, it's, but. it's an interesting one. I just think there needs to be a bit of stability on the regulation side before looking at it more seriously. So at least that's how we're thinking about it. But definitely a very cool product. Yeah, and the industry you're in is very cool. So like health food and uh, nutrition. And so how have you managed to? stand out from all the other protein yeah i think it's a mixture of innovation when it comes to the actual ingredients so creating products that actually have an impact on well-being and it's not just brand and it's got backing from one of the most senior clinical nutritionists in the uk and so from a product perspective we definitely stand out but then on a brand perspective that's really what people are engaging and that's a constant process of work working with individuals that represent your brand that believe in it um, and really marketing that correctly and so it's a mixture of the two and i think that process of creating a brand that makes people feel a certain way is extremely hard to replicate and also constant innovation on our new product lines. It's a real mixture of those three elements. And, and you're using so, social media a lot to get the message out and... Yeah, absolutely. Social media, paid media. Influencers and... Yeah, exactly. It's it's a mix. We don't do one thing. I think what you have to constantly do is test marketing channels to yeah. see where your return is coming from and then double up there. And But it's it's not a finished process. That's always changing. So trial, error, try Exactly. And- it's just a, a series of constant experiments and, and getting more and more granular with each one yeah have you found instagram has been your main platform or one of the main platforms one of certainly not the most um like i said it's a real mix so we're also at shows we go to shows where we actually get to meet a lot of our customers which is okay, how we cool. gather data yeah but given my background in banking we take a very data-driven approach to every single thing that we do and so the amount of data we use the analysis we actually run regression models based on the data points that we have and based on that we know where to spend our budget awesome um so it's a mix a real mix. so you, you sell via your website yes. which i have up now which is very cool oh thank you so much um and then you also do wholesale so you sell we do. to yeah yeah so um we're in Superdrug, Boots, Revital, Argos, Selfridges, various independent stores. Nice. How did you find the process of, of getting into these places? You know, um, a lot of people will say, oh, it was a tough process, this, that, and the other. And of course, there's a lot of hard work involved, but actually the guys that we met in retail and that we've been working with have been wonderful. I think when they back the brand and they believe in the product, the whole process becomes a lot more smooth. And so there's a lot of work involved. It's definitely a longer sort of process than selling on e-com. Yeah, um, yeah, but no, it's a great thing. And you're finding you do more wholesale than no, we're more direct to consumer for sure. Nice, um, or via your website, via our website, Brilliant. yeah, yeah, Brilliant. for sure. Retail is fantastic. We're doing well in retail, but you know, direct to consumer is where we can have the most impact in a more condensed time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we absolutely work with our retailers. I think a lot of people will take the approach that you know what we'll go into retail, but we're just going to push D to C. For us, we'd like to work with our retailers to make sure that they're selling well and we're selling well. Yeah, it's just a function of that that we happen to be selling more on D to C. Fine, but no, we we sell well across. So you've actually invested a lot of time building your direct model. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because back in the day, it was all wholesale was it really i set up a fashion brand okay. well i was a distributor actually so I worked in the fashion sector a lot and so over the last 20 years you've really seen you know new brands such as yourselves and others really focusing more on direct sure because if, if you start selling um you know when someone googles you you want your website to come up first you absolutely can make the yeah. sale at high yeah, margin then yeah. sure yeah, yeah they yeah. might do it somewhere else and sure so it's cool it's cool starting something new and doing what you're doing because ultimately the value for you is people coming to your website engaging with you and buying the product 
product. For sure. I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's cool. definitely a bit of both. So if the buying experience works better for an individual that, say, lives opposite Boots and we're stocked in Boots, that's totally fine. We want to make that as frictionless as possible to make sure that our rate of sale is where it needs to be yeah. in store. And for us, it, ultimately, it is selling the product through different avenues. And so there is the argument as well of overall volumes, blended margin, and, and how you yeah, kind of yeah. make sense of that whole process. And, and we have done. Awesome. And are you just selling in the UK? We sell to 40 countries now, wow. um, nice. mainly through our website. So it's been such an exciting process. And yeah. it's very cool to kind of see pic- people upload pictures of our product when they're sat in Hawaii yeah, or yeah. sat Maybe. across the States. So it's, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Did you focus on marketing? No, to be honest, internationally, it's been 100% organic. So Amazing. we don't spend any money abroad at the moment yeah um although that will soon change and um and they've just come inbound i think that's the beauty of social media that brilliant it's not restrictive to one yeah yeah massive land yeah. you can sort of see it from anywhere which is great and how have you found setting up this this distribution to different countries and that to be honest is not the most challenging bit because you nowadays the infrastructure to get that done is is so simple and so affordable that you can ship to the other side of the world for, for less than a tenner nice. so that part of it is totally fine yeah i think it's more about generating sustainable demand in, in more than one region which is which is the more involved part have you found that be the main challenge you faced not just yet because we haven't taken international markets as seriously as the uk that yeah. like i said that's going to change very soon yeah. but that i suppose we'll find out when we do that but yeah, yeah. so far it's been okay and what, have, what have you seen as like the, the stages you, you started on your own with uh, with your nutritionist yes and you were doing everything. Yes. At what point did you start identifying positions that you wanted filled and really started to build your business? I built out a really, really involved cash flow model day one before we started trading. And so I knew when we'd need to make various hires. Um, obviously, that's up for tweaking and naturally yeah, yeah. it changes. Yeah. And it's a fairly constant work stream. So even kind of the day before we're planning out our hires for next year. Um, and that's different to what we anticipated in pre-launch, but naturally that happens. Yeah. So I knew after certain revenue levels or to get to certain revenue levels, we'd need certain people that are better than me yeah. in certain positions. So that's what we've done. Also, and so how long has it been now? We've just done two years. Wow. So wow. we had a bit of a celebration and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So although it feels like longer. Yeah. Yeah. Feels like longer. It feels like longer, although a, time flies. It's a bit of a weird one. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when you're doing your own thing, I mean, it's all on you. You just got to be on it, right? Oh, for sure. And it just... Seven day work week. It just goes. So it quickly. really does. Yeah, it really does. And my gray hairs have been sprouting up a bit more. Yeah, you've got a lot less than I have. Oh, really? In fact, you've got a lot, a lot more hair than I have. So. <laughs> um, is it what you expected it would be? I'm not sure, actually. I think when you're so in the, in the midst of things, it's hard to sort of remember your expectations. I think actually it's been a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Just the purpose of being able to go into the office with that purpose. And yeah. as long as the growth is there, you're enjoying that process, and which it has been. So yeah, it's been. I think it's been better than what, what I thought it would awesome. be, which is great. And you, and you sound very organized, the planning and everything. And have you, have you found it that it's gone to plan? Because nowadays you find, you know, people do two, three, five-year plans, whatever, yeah. but you find nowadays long, long-term is six months almost. Oh, exactly, are yeah. You, are you finding that it's really quite dynamic and... It's had- very dynamic um, and it, de- it depends on the, the business avenue and the sales avenue. So for Ecom, we, we split up our months into sprints and different sprints will last, you know, different periods of time. So typically it'll be a week, two weeks, but it'll be part of a larger, over- larger overarching strategy nice. so that we can plan for the next 12 months, et cetera, et cetera. But the work is actually broken down into weeks. Brilliant. And so every week there'll be kind of new processes happening to drive sales forward and drive yeah. growth. And that keeps you on your toes, which is a lot of fun. Nice. And do you have a nice support structure around you? So mentors or anyone that you you lean on for advice absolutely pop, pop yeah. to all the family members yeah, are doing yeah. their own thing but so we're actually backed by natwest and okay. um we're part of their incubator program and oh. we just got kind of promoted to their scale up portion nice and that, which is a, has been a fantastic so what was the process of, of getting in there and i was actually talking to natwest about a finance arrangement just so we could sort of deal with some of the retail side of the business and they told me oh you know what you should actually talk to the guys in the scale up portion of natwest they've just opened up this entrepreneurship program why don't you come in for an interview interview was great just ended up chatting for a long time they're impressed with the business and the scale and so they've hosted us in their office space which is fantastic but beyond that they give us access to mentors to acceleration managers and they sort of coach young entrepreneurs and and give them a lot of support which has been fantastic amazing and so you have access to mentor mentors there and i think the value needs to be you you can't really know your mentor beforehand that would be an ideal situation because then they're very objective wait so they just give you someone you can apply so they have sort of 
almost a database of, of various mentors. And so you can approach them, you can talk to kind of your acceleration manager, which who is assigned to you about getting in touch with all of these different people. But even even just talking to founders, yeah, I think that's one of the most fantastic things because they can relate to what you're going through. They they will be facing similar challenges or maybe challenges that you haven't faced or challenges that you've overcome. And so it's a, a real mutually beneficial process there. Brilliant. And they give you office space as well. They do, yeah. Amazing. So we're based in Angel, uh, right in the center of London. Fantastic office space, fifth Perfect. floor near King's Cross. So, nice. Yeah, nice. it's awesome. And it's been, it's been, it must be nice to have somewhere to go to work. Absolutely. I mean, before this, we were based in Harrow. So we did have okay. an office beforehand Fine, anyway. Yeah. yeah. But for sure, central London is just a different kettle of fish. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And you do think you'd be able to attract better people, more people to work with you as well being based there? It's an I mean. interesting one. And, and um, one of the guys on our board certainly thinks so. But I'm not too sure if that that's necessarily true. Gymshark is based in Solihull, super outside the <laughs> yeah, centre. And they true. have some of the most brilliant people in the world. That's true. Yeah. I messaged the founder went and met him he was kind enough to see me kind of one-on-one sat for a couple of hours he went up to Birmingham yeah, yeah. I went to their HQ which is unbelievable yeah. um, so it's in Solihull Solihull yeah. yeah and his name is Ben Francis if you haven't seen his YouTube videos you've got to check them I need out to watch, I need to watch it. I do wear some of his clothes actually oh you too. do yeah yeah, yeah yeah a lot of people are nowadays it's cool but, yeah fantastic clothing and um, <laughs> and he's attracted some brilliant people and he's not based anywhere near London and so or, or the centre of sort of Birmingham and so I'm not sure I think if your mission is strong enough and if you're demonstrating that people can grow with you as individuals as well and you're offering them that path then I think you'll be able to attract talent so it's I, interesting yeah I mean there's clearly more talent near big cities for sure yeah for sure but you are seeing firms like Gymshark and, and in the US you're seeing a lot of firms moving outside the big cities because yeah. it's I mean, rent's expensive. Absolutely. Salaries are really high. Absolutely. Um, but as long as you, I think, as long as you pick somewhere where there's good transport links, for sure, and good unis and schools, sure. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think startups have a have a competitive advantage on talent in that respect. You may not be able to pay the best salaries in the world, but you will be able to involve someone fully in the business. And so I believe that someone's learning curve will be much steeper and more involved if you're working in a startup. And that's why, provided you're able to do that, you should be able to attract talent, although that's obviously a challenge. Yeah, yeah. The young people is interesting with startups because, I mean, what a great place to work as a young person. Yeah. Um, however, you've got to pick the right one because often, if they don't have time to train you, yes, it's tough, right? And, and you have yeah. to be, as a young person, the right mindset that you're comfortable with ambiguity, yes. you're comfortable with something that's not structured. Exactly. Things moving. You know, unlike, say... Um, you know, going into a big bank. Yeah. You know, you touched on it. Very structured, military style. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is what you're doing. Here's the training session. Yeah. So it's interesting. You gotta, you gotta be in the right mindset for this. Oh, things. for sure. It just depends what you want out of life. Yeah, yeah. I think that's just the best way to look at it. If you, if you like a corporate structure, you want set training. You want set hours. You know what you're gonna take home every single month, and it's definitely a corporate argument. Um, but for me, my fear of being bored was greater than the fear of taking risks. Yeah. And yeah. so going into business was something that I was always naturally going to do and so it just depends what you want out of life it's great absolutely I, I was the same yeah of course yeah started yeah. your own business very young and yeah still still a business still going yeah, it's yeah. great fun all of its mindset absolutely you know, but you've got to think carefully about whether or not you want that life for sure um, and if it's for you it's outstandingly fun absolutely and rewarding yeah. and stuff like that yeah, yeah. how did you find uh, it's talked about people obviously the other big things money yes how did you find raising cash and finding investors and so forth? Fundraising is a, an interesting one. And I think you have to be you have to be careful because you need to pick investors that hopefully have, have some experience or exposure to your vertical because that way you can have more meaningful conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's not just about money, but I think people do confuse that and think fundraising is just about the money. So um, you wanted money and intellect experience. Yeah, I think someone once called it capital plus. Get the capital plus you get that experience and value add because... That is so important that you're able to have conversations with whether it be your board or just angel investors or if you've got VC backing with your VC that elevate your business model and, and position you in the correct way for an exit if that's what you're going for. Yeah, yeah. And so that's something that I think we've done successfully. We've got really fantastic people on board. Great. And they get involved so far as advising us on strategy, which it, which is exactly what we wanted. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So you got them involved in your board, let's say. Yeah. So they have a seat at, seat at the table. They meet you once a quarter or whatever. And Yeah, I mean, on those sort of things, it's even if it's not an official board seat, yeah. they're always happy to meet us um, Great. and have a chat about kind of 
where are we headed? Where where do you see the next six months? Or how have the past you know couple of quarters gone? That kind of thing, and just prodding us and poking holes in our thinking, which is ex- which is very helpful. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. some people find that uncomfortable, but for us, we just want to make sure that we are covered from all angles and that we're yeah. seeing everything fully. And so our investors help us do that for sure. That's great. And you didn't go down the crowdfunding route? A few of my friends are going down that route. I don't think at, at our seed route, at our seed level, it was f- for us right. necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's harder to get that value add if you've got, I don't know, 100 investors through the crowd and you yeah. can't go and chat to each one. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with raising on the crowd. Some people have done it really well. Brewdog is obviously grown yeah, phenomenally yeah, yeah, and sure, they're a crowd yeah. company but I don't think it was for us at that stage but never say never fine I should be open to a little crowdfunding yeah yeah I, we'd be open to looking at it yeah, I'm yeah. not sure if it's a route that we would necessarily go down but always keeping the options open yeah, yeah. you never know it's great when you started you kind of I guess self-funded yes and then from day one you started to look for some maybe cornerstone investors high net worths that could start to yeah, I think we were lucky that we actually got a lot of inbounds because we fairly publicly grew quite quickly, um, just getting listings and yeah. social approval and off, I mean, social media following went up very quickly as well. And so we were lucky to get a lot of inbounds. And through that, you sort of build out your network and have those conversations. And that's yeah, sort, yeah. sort of how it happened. Awesome. That's really cool. And do you, you don't have a co-founder, right? So I have two. There's um, two, right? Yeah. Okay. So one of my co-founders, her name is Steph. Yeah. Um, so Steph is basically in charge of our product development. So she's been working really hard on our new product range, which I'm hoping will drop by December, Jan, although it's cool. it's now November, so I'm right. not sure. December, Jan. Yeah. We'll stick a little link on the show notes so people can click and oh, perfect. go through. And my other co-founder, his name's Alex, so he's in charge of our retail division. And so he, he he's fantastic, fully on top of it, driving great sale, working with the whole supply chain. And we all sort of work together to drive strategy forward. Awesome. So yeah. you started on your own. I did, yeah. At what point in time did you think, I want some help, some co-founders to... I just think it's a natural progression um, because you as a solo founder can't can't do everything. And I think it's wrong for you to have absolute decision making on every vertical because you need people that see things differently to you to be making decisions in the verticals that you're not as good as them in yeah and and so recognizing what you're not good at and what other people are very good at you, it just forms easy decisions and yeah. so it was never it was never a difficult conversation or something to overcome i think it was just a natural thing yeah picking a co-founder is tough right i mean absolutely, you're yeah. spending seven days a week with them absolutely more time than you are with your family oh yeah did you know them before no um how did you go didn't about know selecting? either of them before i think I'm not sure if you read this book, The Founder's Dilemma. No, no. And it talks about kind of exit valuations correlated to if you know your co-founder before. One of the chapters goes into that a little bit. Cool. And I think generally speaking, it works better if you don't know your co-founders before. That's what the data suggests anyway. Oh, interesting. Just because you can talk a lot more objectively about your goals and the business strategy. Yeah. And it allows your thinking to be a lot more transparent, which I think has to be sort of the core of how you run your business. It has to be transparent. Yeah. And often if you've known someone for a very long time, you know their emotional cues and so you may kind of hesitate to this be as transparent. There. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas between yeah. the three of us there's no there's no filter and that's brilliant. And that's why we work worked really well together yeah. and we're good friends as well. Oh, amazing. So it was kind of like speed dating, right? Sort of. So you yeah. like met them for an hour or two and you thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think um <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's sort of, to be honest, I mean... Um, I mean they, recruitment is kind of like speed dating, if we're honest. I mean, you're, uh, yeah. you're meeting someone for an hour yeah, to yeah. decide whether you want to spend most of your life sitting with them and... Exactly. You know. Oh, that's an interesting interesting way to look at it. I might have to tell both of them that and uh, <laughs> see what they say. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and so what are your plans for the future now? So you I think talked international... Absolutely, yeah. Li- lines? International markets are, are a definite choice for us. I think it's just about positioning that correctly and facing that out well uh, so that we can manage our markets marketing budgets and, and growth efficiently. Great. But really, it's a story of scale. Um, so we've got new products in the pipeline specifically for certain sectors, and it's about releasing those successfully, maintaining great rate of sale, and also growing our D2C channels. Um, so that's our plan. And great. so we've got a, a very kind of hectic few years ahead. I love ahead. it. And the Brexit? Do you oh. see that? going to have a bit of a... Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> no, I mean, we've made... I mean, we've all production's UK, so... Exactly. I mean, that's that, great. That's a thing that really helps us. Yeah. So we're all UK-based, and so selling within the UK, obviously, from an, from an import perspective, it, it doesn't hit us in that way. Um, but let's see what Brexit even means. I mean, that's going to give us clarity. We have got contingency plans about, you know, should should it mean one thing, then we've got, oh, good. got okay, kind yeah. of a plan. But fingers crossed that it's... Uh, 
not too disruptive. Hopefully, but it will see. all work out. Everything works out in the end. Oh, absolutely. And you know, maybe Brexit will happen one day. Let's see. Who knows? Who We've knows? got an election to come first. Absolutely. Um, but look, well done with everything you're doing. It's great to speak to people there. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Doing yeah. things. And no, great to speak to you and look forward to watching your journey. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Thank you.